We don't know. We are stumped. Uh, scientists around the world are saying, what the heck is this object? It doesn't fit any of the profiles of the usual suspects. That's the problem. The usual suspects are comet, meteor, stars, star. galaxies, planets. How about uh, some sort of alien dealio? Could you be. Into that? Well, you know, the object is about the size of the Rose Bowl, Rose Bowl Stadium. So it's too small to be a planet or a star or a galaxy. And it's not a comet. There's no gas in the tail of that comet. It's not a meteor because it's not inside the Earth's atmosphere. Uh -huh. So what is it? We're scratching our head. The physical nature of Planet X is well debated, and the three most commonly discussed object characteristics for it are an asteroid-like object. It could be an extremely massive and rocky asteroid-like body. Most likely, it will be dragging debris along with it and might even have a thin wisp of an atmosphere. It could also be a comet-like object. Comets are more brittle than asteroids, and like asteroids, will be dragging debris along with them and more. This is because comets are also surrounded by a veil of dust, plasma, and gas. Worse yet, it could be a mini constellation. An ominous combination of the worst aspects of an asteroid-like body with those of a comet-like body. A mini constellation contains a large central object which will have a cluster of satellites orbiting it, such as planets, planetoids, moons, and so forth. Like an asteroid-like object, the central object of the mini-constellation could have an atmosphere, as could one or more of its satellites. Each of these three types of Planet X objects presents a different range of threats to the Earth, but topping that list is something we call the electrical kill zone. To define the electrical kill zone, we need to use three different coordinates. The first coordinate is the Sun itself, and the other two are based on two different points in the path that Planet X will follow as it swings around the Sun before it returns to the outer rim of our solar system. All available data indicates that Planet X is approaching from the south. For this reason, the second position we need to discuss is what astronomers call the ecliptic, or the equatorial plane of our solar system. To help visualize the ecliptic, let's start at a point in the center of the Sun, and then draw a line from there to the Earth, and then rotate it along with the Earth. At the edge of the plane will be the 12 signs of the zodiac. Understanding the ecliptic is important because the known major planets of our solar system all orbit on or near this imaginary plane. And today astronomers look for this planet, they call it Planet X. Uh, they mean maybe the unknown planet, but it's also the 10th planet. They call it Nibiru which means planet of the crossing and the ancient symbol was the cross not from christian times but from six thousand years ago and they say that this planet the 12th member of our solar system has a very large orbit of 3600 years and every 3600 years it comes between mars and jupiter close to us and it is then they said that people, uh, people that look like us, not uh, <laughs> with little horns or green, uh, people they look, that look like us started to come between their planet and Earth about 450,000 years ago. Why do they look like us? We look like them. Because if you know the Bible, which is based on the Sumerian tales, at some point, they engaged in genetic engineering and mixed their genes with the genes of uh, Homo erectus. We can use uh, various uh, uh, scientific terms, but let's say with, with early hominids to bring about Homo sapiens. By some as estimates, there are as many as 50 different names for Planet X and this object is prominently mentioned in the folklore and wisdom texts of many cultures worldwide. For example, 
It is referred to as the destroyer by the ancient Egyptians in the Colburn Bible and by the ancient Hebrews in the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, and again in the New Testament as Wormwood. In fact, the observatory most likely to publish the official discovery of Planet X will be Project Wormwood at the Learmouth Solar Observatory in the northwestern tip of Australia. However, no matter what we eventually call it or how it eventually appears, make no mistake, it's going to hurt. This forecast begins on September 1, when we first enter the danger zone. The threat level for this day is zero. On September 2nd, LNN arrives in the vicinity near the sun where an electromagnetic event between the two bodies first becomes a faint possibility. On September 11, 2011, Elenin reaches its point of perihelion. Here, it is at its closest distance to the Sun, which is approximately 45 million miles. At this time, it also transits the ecliptic, the plane of our solar system. As all the other major planets in our solar system orbit the Sun on or within a few degrees of the ecliptic, this is when Elenin is virtually on a level plane with the other planets. At this time, there is the strongest possibility of an electromagnetic event involving the Sun. The maximum threat date for this forecast is September 26, 2011 during a direct inferior conjunction. In this alignment, Elenin is found directly between the Sun and Earth. The principal concern with this inferior conjunction alignment is the possibility of a catastrophic electromagnetic event involving all three objects, the Sun, Comet Elenin, and the Earth. Such an event could produce cosmic lightning bolts and this alignment will put Earth squarely in the crosshairs of this threat. At this time, we could see a violent solar interaction heading directly towards the Earth, along with increased seismic and volcanic activity, as Elenin briefly becomes as bright as a second sun in the sky. By October 1, 2011, the threat begins to ease off as Elenin moves away from its inferior conjunction alignment with the Sun and the Earth. Thus, we can expect a slightly reduced chance of an electromagnetic event. However, the threat of residual seismic and volcanic activity does remain. We see a significant but temporary drop of the threat level on October 17, 2011. This is when Elenin crosses Earth's orbit. At this point, it will reach its estimated closest distance to the Earth at some 21.5 million miles. To help put this in perspective, the average distance between Venus and the planet Earth is approximately 26 million miles. Given this distance to the Earth, there is the reduced possibility of an electromagnetic event along with residual and seismic activity on Earth. However, we do see the threat level increasing once again through the later half of October and into November. The period between November 3 to November 7, 2011 puts us into the second highest threat level for several days as Earth passes through Elenin's tail. During this time, we may see large meteor showers and some deadly impact events. We should also expect higher levels of seismic and volcanic activity. On or about November 8, 2011, Earth will exit common Elenin's tail. Although completing this transit will dramatically reduce the threat level, concerns over residual seismic and volcanic activity will persist we once again see an increase in the threat level from November 20th to November 25th, 2011. This is when Elenin will be aligned in opposition to the Earth. At this time, Earth will be directly in between the Sun and Elenin. 
This opposition alignment could possibly trigger a solar storm aimed directly at the Earth. At this time, this alignment also increases the possibility of catastrophic seismic and volcanic events. By November 26, 2011, we begin to see a significant reduction in the threat level. At this time, we are vulnerable to the last and least significant possibility that Elenin could trigger a catastrophic solar storm aimed at the Earth. However, residual seismic and volcanic activity will continue to be a concern. From the period December 15, 2011 to January 15, 2012, we see the most significant threat reduction as Comet Elenin speeds away from the Sun towards the furthest reaches of our solar system. During this period, the risk of residual seismic and volcanic activity will begin to subside. On or about January 16, 2012, we finally exit the danger zone of this Comet Elenin flyby with a final threat level of zero. At that time, the only thing left will be to wonder about what so comes the questions next. now become. If Comet Elenin proves to be the Blue Star Kachina Harbinger of Hopi prophecy, how do we survive?